Yeah, great. Thank you for coming along. Yeah, yeah. And thank you for coming along. Uh, I'm Dan Whitman. I'm a professor of sociology here at the University of Melbourne, and it's wonderful to see if you're both from sociology here. Thank you for coming along. Uh, this this uh, this panel, this lunchtime panel, is part of some some shared uh, sessions we're doing as part of this Congress of the Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. It's the inaugural, which means that I'm planning to have more than one. Uh, but let's get through this one first, hey. But I'd like to say thank you <coughs> for being here at the University of Melbourne, uh, Professor Russell Goulbon, who's in the who's in the back corner here for for supporting this event and being willing to host the the inaugural event, which always means we're signing up to something a little bit uncertain when, when it's called that. But uh, it's going very well so far. We've had some wonderful partners running the lunchtime sessions. But just before I introduce our panel, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands of the Rwanda people of the Kulin Nation. I'm Stephen Lands, and I want to acknowledge their elders past and present. So in this, this Congress that we're holding over this week, we've got 22 different associations holding events, conferences, workshops. And one of the events that opened the Congress on the weekend was the um, Australian Anthropology Society. They had a distinguished lecture from Professor uh, Kathleen Butler from the University of Newcastle, actually, uh, like, uh, like our chair today. Uh, Kathleen Butler is an Aboriginal woman of the Bunjalung and Warami people from the coast of New South Wales. He was talking about the relationship between Aboriginal studies and anthropology, but more broadly, I think about the social sciences and the relationship between us and the communities we're part of and observe. And she asked that audience that I was part of, that I got to hear, to reflect on do we create our community as a resource for us, or are we a resource for our community? And that made me think not just about our relationship, relations, working to this place, in the context of compassion, the very sense of the voice, but about the work that this mission. And it made me think, well, we're going to have coming up just about this question of how our university is a part of the university in which we're going to um, so, so with that welcome, I want to introduce our panel, which has been put together by the Australasian Council of the Women's Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, which, uh, as you probably guessed by the name, is a pretty important partner for us with this Congress. So I'm, um, as well as being a, a professor here, I'm the president of a group called uh, the Council of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, putting together this Congress. And we have some university members, some industry members, but, but now, core group is uh, the discipline associations in Australia. So sociology, anthropology, philosophy, history, linguistics, such. Uh, but to pull off an event like this and to make a difference in people, I mean, the deans and, and the, the resources, influence, but also um, occasional words of wisdom that they can bring along as partners has been really important. So grateful to, to now the immediate past president. Kathy Coleman for, for backing this event right from the start, agreeing to be part of it. And I'll hand over to Professor Coleman now who will introduce our wonderful panel. Thank you. Oh, well, look, thank you very, very much, Dan, and uh, for all your support of, of DASH as well. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, my DASH colleagues here, obviously, uh, Dean of Arts, Russell Goldman, and Andrea Rizzi um, from the University of Melbourne, um, Associate Dean Research, I believe, and uh, thank the panel members who I'll introduce in a moment. I'd also like to acknowledge, uh, it's not going to work again, but that's okay. Um, acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Wurundjeri peoples. Thank you. And um, pay my respects to elders past and present and future. And uh, there's some other important names there on that particular slide. And, and also First Nations people everywhere. Um, in fact, as Dan was saying, that's such an important part of our imagining of partnerships beyond the university uh, and with our various and diverse communities. And uh, in Newcastle, um, I work in the lands of the Awabakal and Waramai peoples and pay my respects to them too. 
So thank you very much, everybody, for coming to this event. I think this is going to be um, really exciting. Dash wanted to contribute to this event, and I want to thank Russell for putting this panel together, really. Russell did this work and uh, with Joe, I believe, organised the speakers. So if I haven't quite got that right, but I think that's how it all happened, transpired. Uh, so I'm, I'm really a bit of an interloper, and I'm here to learn about what we're talking about, particularly about this idea that universities have become more and more concerned about their public good and about uh, benefit to communities and partnership with communities. And Dash was a little concerned, like many humanities and social science and arts researchers, about the commercialisation of learning. And so we've been trying to reorient the debates a little bit and think more about how universities can work with community partners to do work that's important and vital and have uh, and make contributions rather than focusing on this idea of commercialisation. So I think these things are a little bit thorny and tangled and I think we'll untangle them here today. So I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, that's just a little description of, of the panel. It's in uh, various bits of media that you can read about. And we've got their lovely photographs here. So uh, <laughs> to the right here, we have Professor Jo Barraquette. She's Professor of Policy Studies and Director of the Melbourne Social Equity Institute at the university here. And she's Australia's premier researcher of social enterprise and a leading researcher of social innovation. And she's focused on social equity. And she's also done some really important work before she came to this university at Swinburne, which I'm sure she'll say more about. And then I have here uh, Dr. Kate Burrell, who's the Chief Impact Officer and co-founder of Street, uh, a Melbourne-based food system work integration social enterprise, or WISE acronym. Uh, that runs tailored and supported work experience, training and employment programs. And Kate's a forensic and clinical psychologist. We've just been chatting before now about mental health research and has much experience in private and public sectors. And very importantly, last but not least, Dr. Sharon uh, Zivkovich, founder and CEO of the Community Capacity Builders and co-founder and chief innovation officer of Wicked Lab. And Sharon, you're a scholar practitioner um, who has both practical and academic experience in social entrepreneurship and active citizenship, systems change and research commercialization and autism. So an incredibly rich array of experiences and, and contributions to make. And interestingly, Community Capacity Builders is developing a centre for autistic social enterprise or entrepreneurship rather, based on Sharon's learnings and lived experience. So we might talk a bit about that today. So together what we want to do here today, and we are uh, recording this for future audiences, so hopefully that can be shared later on, we want to talk about how academic researchers can learn about the work that these experts have done, including how to support non-university uh, enterprises and uh, social ventures. And so really, I think I need to hand over now to these experts as I'm learning so much as well. And so what we've asked each person to do is talk for a few minutes about their work. But first of all, we're going to ask Joe to define social enterprise slash social venture for us before we get too deep into it. So Joe. Kathy, um, we just thought we might like to do that so that we're on the same page because it's weasel words to many people who don't know uh, what social things are. Um, in a nutshell, uh, social ventures are businesses that seek to create public or community benefit, and that's their primary purpose. Uh, they, it's not their primary purpose to uh, generate profits for individual shareholders or owners. That's the very broad definition. Uh, I've got the mic, I'll do the 30 second um, history uh, for you. And for those of you who um, come in with your critical filters on, which as a political sociologist, I hope all the sociologists in the room are doing, um, if you're sitting there thinking it's just a neoliberalisation of government, just hold for a sec. We can identify a number of ways. So um, colleagues like uh, Ella Henry and um, Anne Maria Pareto, uh, who both have backgrounds uh, and with expertise in Indigenous entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, have identified that uh, social venturing in various forms has uh, strong parallels with uh, the history of uh, kinship-based and uh, collectivist approaches to economies among many past and contemporary Indigenous communities across the world. Uh, then we can identify at least four waves in Western history of social entrepreneurship and social enterprises. The first was the cooperative movement, 
which was a response to the problems of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the second was uh, a response to the then called new social movements in the 1960s and early 70s, uh, where people were looking at the ways in which they could collectively self-determine their economic futures. We then saw the neoliberalisation um, and, and uh, residualisation of the welfare state, where we started to see social enterprises talked about as ways that governments could get things done cheaper, faster, uh, quicker through the not-for-profit sector rather than delivering services. And then the fourth wave, which connects to some of the past ones, is the sort of social innovation agenda, um, which is uh, finding new solutions to complex social problems uh, driven by technological advances, as well as some of the other pressures that have been created through the um, neoliberalisation of the welfare state, etc. And um, just acknowledging that Kate and Sharon are my colleagues and friends, and I put them squarely in the social innovation camp. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. That's really, really helpful for me too. Um, so we'll go back now and we'll come back around to Joe. So Kate, would you like to talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing? Sure. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so try and be organised and not disorganised about this. Um, so currently the, the work that I'm doing is with the street where I, um, we describe ourselves as a um, a food system uh, work integration social enterprise, which is just a particular type of social enterprise. It's one where we uh, have, in our case, 16 to 24 year olds, priority job seekers. So people who face a whole bunch of barriers to employment um, and they come and do uh, what we call a learning to earning um, training pathways within street. Uh, and Street simultaneously runs a number of businesses, um, uh, mostly in hospitality, uh, a little bit in horticulture, in which the young people do their training and employment pathways. Um, and those same businesses generate the revenue for to, to do the whole thing. So um, up until before the pandemic, we were we got to ninety percent self funded, um, paying for all of those programs ourselves with zero point seven percent government funding, and we calculated with the help of of um, universities, and I'll talk a bit later about the partnerships that we've had with research and academics, and very very useful applied um, partnerships to to advance knowledge, create knowledge, but also enable us to improve what we're doing and go further. But some of that research uh, demonstrated that we had saved um, up to fifty million dollars to the governments by providing these these services um so so that's the current work that i do there my, my professional background is clinical forensic psychology is a whole backstory on how and why we started street which is probably not for today um and then i had a for a little while um when we started street um street wasn't able to employ me at the same time because we just didn't have the revenue at that point so i continued as a forensic psych and went back to school and did my phd uh, in politics, which was uh, doing interviews with people about how and why did they get out of um, violent extremist terrorist groups. Um, and so that sounds quite disconnected from what we're doing, except that it's around how do, how do people who feel so disconnected build bridges back into society. And largely that's what we do at Street is build bridges for people to walk across to get connected yeah. back in. And we do that with the enormous assistance of a whole range of um, of researchers with a capital R, little r, and some of them you know, in, in wonderful institutions and some of them more sort of grassroots partnerships as well. Thank you so much. It's, it's um, really important before we move to Sharon and then back to Joe, how interesting each individual person's background is in terms of their studies and their, their own kind of learning and their own application of that. So that was excellent. Thank you very much. So Sharon, tell us a little bit about your journey because you wanted to talk in, the, in those terms about how you've learned along the way. Yes, yeah, so um, I must admit, you know, looking at the idea of commercialisation of the, the opening, um, I've kind of like used university commercialisation opportunities with my research to further my social enterprises, so to develop my social enterprises. So uh, community capacity builders, the you know, before that, worked on a lot of urban regeneration projects with communities. Um, then I received a, a scholarship of business initiatives for graduates from the University of Adelaide. And I think back in those days, it was an engineering school. So they, they put me up in an incubator, gave me a stipend. I did a master's in entrepreneurship and um, a nine point subject was that was developing the product, which was community capacity builders, like main product for many, many, many years, which was a, a community capacity building program. 
Um, so the resourcing from the university together with the opportunity to do research and develop a product kind of like went together. I was the odd person out though, in that um, the one subject I had trouble with was that the whole, you know, the the whole measurement of impact because they just didn't get it at all. So there was, I've always, I've used the commercialization part of universities to further social enterprises, uh, but the traditional commercialization part. So I've always been like the odd person out, haven't quite fitted it, but I've still used that system to progress. Um, and so for my PhD, I tracked 19 graduates from Community Capacity Builders Program over two and a half years, interviewing them every six months to see how they used that, how they, how they were able to use the knowledge and skills developed during the program to actually create change in communities and also look at the enabling and blocking factors. And from that, the, it was just really surprising with regards to the blocking factors and use complexity science to understand what was happening. Um, and then developed a model based on complexity science for systems change in communities. Um, and then once again, it was through uh, the University of South Australia, co-founder and I, Emily Humphreys, we pitched the idea of turning this model into computer software um, at a, a prize for entrepreneurship within the university. And we won that prize and that paid for the um, for the minimum viable product for software and also the formation of Wicked Lab the second. Um, so use the whole commercial approach. So, you know, two things kind of happening together, the learning through university courses and also the commercialization process, um, but have used it for social enterprise. Mm. That sounds like in your case, universities have been um, enablers rather than not. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's been a really great opportunity to be able to, and also I've, I've got adjunct positions with universities. I, I publish, even though I've got a couple of social enterprises, I publish a couple of journal articles a year. Mm. Um, so it's been an ongoing middle of the road with both. Mm, okay, thank you very much. All right, great. And we'll go back to you, and then we'll start another round of questions. Um, I just want to observe that uh, Sharon does what social entrepreneurs do, which is use the systems available to get what she wants to create social value. So it's great to hear you talking about you know, using the mainstream commercialization agenda for good, not for evil. <laughs> um, so just a quick reflection on me. I'm not going to do 30 years of social enterprise research, but um, I actually started my social enterprise journey here. I was a 17 year old university student attending the Student Science and Sustainability Conference. And I went to the University of Melbourne Student um, Union's food cooperative. And it blew me away. Mm -hmm. So awesome. It was like a demonstration project of environmental consumption. It was owned by the students, they were running it, they were generating the um, revenue from it, et cetera. So I went back to the University of New South Wales where I was studying and helped friends there to create the University of New South Wales student food cooperative, which still exists now some 35 years later. Um, so uh, that's a um, lifelong interest in uh, economic self-determination and collective uh, business models, um, which then became a PhD on the socio-political uh, aspects of the cooperative movement. And then over time, as social enterprises become a thing, you know, I was the Social enterprise research and have done a lot of sort of basic mapping um, of the sector in this country. So I've had a bit of um, But I guess I just wanted to pick up, given the context for this discussion, it's not all about social enterprise, it's about the broader colleagues that have reflected on themselves about universities. I think for me, what I'm passionate about now is uh, I'm still always really passionate about university use of content. That's my content. Which and I actually think we've got a couple of frontiers in the social sciences, acknowledging I'm a social scientist, not a socialist, um, and, and the basic ones, which are really exciting. One of them is digitization and all of the you know, automation type stuff that I'm actually find all the alarming. So, um, the other is the potential for more co productive and systems oriented research. So, working, you know, this is well and truly beyond you know, participatory. Actually, about the ways in which we can 
um, expose ourselves collectively to diverse sources of evidence, to close the binaries that we go through, to implement those um, in real time with the search wrapped around action in order to reinvest that knowledge uh, in, into practice as we go. And I think one of the things that's really struck me in my work is I've done a lot of uh, a former boss when I ran up the year over the and say, James, you're really good at training bad money to be doing academic outputs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I was pretty much like, yeah, to make sure I was going to be still producing the quite some of the conversation. <laughs> the thing that I've come to, to think about in relation to that is the power of ad hoc research work. So, when, when, you know, historically we've talked about deductive and inductive research. But now that has a form of where you're going backwards and forwards between varying practice. And that could be raised in time context, context where practice is actually about stripping theory. I don't mean it's a way to get theory, some of it's bad practice, but often the explanatory frameworks that we have don't explain what's going on. So I think adaptive research is really important, and I love doing that. Mm. So, um, Joe, we wanted to stay with you because I, I know that at the beginning you were talking about maybe some academic scholars inside universities might have trouble with some of these concepts because they might see them as part of an agenda. Um, could you perhaps tease that out a little bit? And, and I think we, we thought you might help us understand how we have to challenge ourselves to do this work as well in, in the Hass kind of discourse. Yeah, so I think, um, I think all cards on the table, I'm a post-structuralist, I'm interested in rendering visible what is rather than make normative judgments about being good, bad, or otherwise, if I, you know, as a normative person, I have my own strong opinions. Um, so I certainly, I think there's a danger with these kinds of conversations that one becomes an evangelist for a particular position, and I don't have a particular position. I believe 100% um, in the importance of discovery research, both um, academic freedom and all the things that many of us hold here. I don't think it's an either or conversation. I think it's a both and conversation. And I also think that it's not for everybody. Um, but that said, uh, going back to my previous comments, I don't want to take the floor for too long. I think there's real scholarly power in doing this, as well as real human um, value in working in partnership, in engaged work that makes a difference on the ground. Now, I don't know a single academic who does work who's not interested in making a difference. It's just for some people, that difference is a difference to the discipline. You know, that's the impact that colleagues are looking for. Um, some of us are looking for making a difference to the world, and, so, and many are looking for both. Um, and I think that that's probably where we need to um, have a look. But then I guess really quickly, I think as has scholars in some context, we can very social science again, we can think creatively about how we can do some of this differently. So I'll just tell you one really quick story. I did in partnership with the National Mapping and Social Enterprise Report was a thing with an organisation called Social Traders. I deliberately asked social traders to hold the IV for that project. And so then every time government came to me to commission me to do more work, we would charge them a licence fee that went back to social traders, which was not true. Mm. And social traders actually earned more money from that project than they could do. They knew what to do with it. Yeah, that is great. And I think that sometimes the stumbling block for academics, that at least the ones I know in my, my world in Newcastle, is how do you do that? So how do you make that stuff happen? So I want to throw now to Kate and talk about what um, the ideal conditions are for social ventures. What what makes success and what can go wrong? Absolutely. That's a big question. Big question. I'm still stuck on abductive. I love it. I didn't, I didn't know that was the word for it. And it's not what, you know, it's not the dumpster. It's not just about my abs either. <laughs> <laughs> All of those things. So thank you. Thank you for that word. Um, the ideal conditions, not just for social venture, but for engaging uh, knowledge creation. Yeah, for, um, so I actually did think about this. And in an effort not to ramble on for the next 45 minutes, um, I, I just wrote down my five top things that I think um, make for the ideal conditions. Um, and so the first one is uh, a little bit to what Joe was just saying, to take the time um, to understand what the social venture is all about, because they're really complex um, and they don't stand still. 
And so some of the challenges that we've had when engaging with, uh, with researchers is they've got a fairly fixed idea of A, what it is that we do, B, what the research is, is going to look like and see how that's going to run. And then we, we run into trouble in the first five minutes because within five minutes, what we're doing on the ground has actually changed and therefore the research needs to be able to I, I keep up with that, be fold that in, um, learn from it immediately. So we put into practice anything that we learn straight away, which of course changes like the landscape. And if you're doing fairly traditional research where you hold a thing still long enough to observe it, review it, uh, and, and maybe that's got to be the case for six or 12 months, um, we, we've, we've left the building by then. Um, and because we're working in real time with real people, we're not going to pause um, something just to, to wait for the research to, to catch up, but nor are we going to keep implementing a thing that we've just learned can be done a better way. So we'll put your research into practice straight away, but the research then has to be able to be flexible enough to run, run with that. Um, second one is, is essentially to be a good date. I had a ruder version of it, and Joe helpfully reframed it in the positive. Mine was don't be a but then became the date. So it would be an eggplant. It would be, be an eggplant emoji. Um, no, and by that, what I mean is, is, is any, any research, like it's, it's a relationship, right? And with, with real people um, and, and on both sides, everybody's time poor under enormous pressure. And so, so everyone's going to play nicely, um, but have a, have a long-term relationship in mind. And if you think about the research as the children that, that you know, are going to be kind of co-parented for a period of time and they're going to connect you forever, and it sort of puts you in the frame of mind of, of having a good good relationship to basis um, to co-create the research plan uh, and to name potentially what the outcomes might might be. So for a, for us as a social enterprise, we want to use it. We want it to be usable, and we also want to share it. Uh, and at Street, we've 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 done some amazing research with several of the teams that Joe's been a part of, and, and some other terrific researchers as well. Um, but we always want to. Get, get the usables and set them, set them free. We want to give them away to our social enterprise partners and we don't want paywalls in the way. And that doesn't always sit so neatly with, with, a, with, with a university where they might need to recoup something or kind of hold, hold the IP pretty tightly. So there's something around naming what the outcomes might be and the, and the shape and the form of them. Um, uh, obviously they need to be scientifically solid. That's why we're doing it in partnership. Um, and both, Beck, my, my co-founder and my wife um, like we have a science background we completely love and appreciate the importance and the value of a, you know, empirically uh, based and, and scientifically solid research but it also has to be good enough that it can be used today and tomorrow whilst it's being improved so there's something about that and the last one I'd say is, is have fun it kind of goes back to the relationship thing but everybody's tired everyone's exhausted researchers and, and everyone is under pressure um, social enterprise practitioners work incredibly hard and so if we're going to save the world and and bring new knowledge into it at the same time I think we might as well have fun mm. I'm looking forward to hearing some examples um, when we come back around perhaps but where I've seen things uh, go wrong they're all along the lines of what you just been saying when there are barriers in the way when the timelines are flexible uh, or where researchers kind of try and take where it might go and just kind of work on the ground. So that was really, really helpful. Thank you so much. But we will get some examples. So Sharon, you've learned along the way, as we were saying before, and you've been listening to really diverse communities about what their needs are. So when you were talking, I was thinking it'd be great to hear, yeah, again, an example of, of what kind of work you've been doing and how you work through whatever those steps were with those diverse communities. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Yeah, it's been it's been really easy for, for me in a way because um, I, I left school at 14 and I spent 16 years on welfare. And so one of my first urban renewal projects was the disadvantaged community that I came from. And I was employed as the employment development officer and everyone knew me. And so they couldn't believe I could recruit all these long-term unemployed people onto these programs, but they were all friends. And so it was like really easy. And then they were bringing, you know, mothers and brothers and sisters onto these programs because there was a lot of trust in it. And it was, and it was, it was time when there was a really high level of unemployment. It was back at the end of the nineties. We ran a few programs called How to Be Enterprising in the New World of Work um, and started up some, one of the most amazing was this organisation of the Northern Enterprise that formed um, and six, and I had another mate who uh, took 16 of these long-term unemployed folk 
um, through certificate four and assessment of workplace training. So we had 16 of this long-term unemployed people all of a sudden became trainers and they went as a collective, went after contracts with the government to provide um, financial management um, a training in schools. Um, so it was just incredible. So I've always, yeah, so I've always been able to connect really well with disadvantaged people because it is my roots, it's, it's coming from those communities. Um, when I track the 19 um, leaders from, I've always played with the active citizens, so citizens that are, are, are trying to make change in communities. So tracking the, the 19 um, graduates from Community Capacity Builders program for that two and a half years, I could really relate to the challenges they were finding with coming up against brick walls, working with government, etc. So that was that was really um, interesting. Um, and now uh, I've recently had an autism diagnosis, so I am autistic and working with other autistic social entrepreneurs and the benefit um, of being able to control your work environment because the the unemployment statistics for um, autism is three times that of disability. Um, and part of that is the, the whole thing of, you know, the sensitivities in, in, in work environments. So this whole movement now with regards to autistic social entrepreneurship and and even more broadly, you know, lived experience, uh, folk with lived experience being able to, you know, they've got such a good understanding of the challenges um, being able to at least in leadership positions with social enterprises. So yes, I've, I've been quite lucky with regards to the diversity of communities that I've worked with on this journey. Yeah, no, it's really, it's great. Now we did talk about you asking each other questions and having a conversation. And I'm wondering if anyone in our um, gathering here, our audience has any questions for the panel. Um, yes, we've got one. So we might need to give you the microphone because of the recording. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. So interesting so far. Uh, this is a question particularly for Joe, but for the panel as a whole. So in the context of this Congress of Haas, what does Haas bring to the table that perhaps other disciplines like business or engineering don't? Or what's yeah, what's the value of Haas in particular in this space? It's a great question, although I think business sort of sits in the social sciences myself. I'm a political sociologist who's managed to look like an entrepreneurship scholar for the last decade. Um, but really, I think, uh, I mean, there's there's the methodological work. I think we've got a lot because we have diverse epistemic and ontological frameworks. We have a lot stronger consciousness of that than we get in STEM. Um, and that's really important. And the other piece is that, I mean, obviously there's a lot of disciplines in house, but generally speaking, we're good at relational work. We recognize relationality. And um, that I think is absolutely critical to how social enterprises function. Um, and it's also critical to, um, you know, even attempting to solve complex adaptive problems. So I think that that's, you know, in a nutshell what um, has brings. But I think the other, just going to the commercialization agenda, so I, we picked this up quickly in conversation before this session, it was actually uh, suggested to me by someone from um, Melbourne's research innovation and commercialization team the other day. I think one of the things that's going on at the moment with the commercialization agenda, I would say, is a slightly, um, misdirected assumption that what we should be doing is making all the academics become entrepreneurs and commercialize all our work, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, I think one of the things that we do in um, PASS is we are very much the research and development um, engine of a lot of organizations, whether they be social enterprises or um, not-for-profits, civil society organizations more broadly. So, you know, you've both talked about um, examples of that. And I do think that that's something that we we'll probably need to get clear about in the house conversation mm -hmm. about where we fit in the commercialization agenda. We're not all going to go on and start businesses, but there are many businesses and organizations in our country and our world that would not operate without, you know, uh, people from our disciplines being involved in the work. Yeah, thank you very much. Would anyone else like to pick up that comment? Question? Uh, I'd just like to say that, you know, for someone who's who's done a PhD in commercialised 
you know, in a, in a, you know my my idea of commercialization is just going through a product where you're bringing a, a you're you're birthing something new into the world, um, and I, I think the money for that kind of process is tied up in the traditional you know software tech kind of parts of the university. Um, and I just, I, I would say, go claim the space, go, go go in there with your social science innovation that you've come up with and go in there and you're not going to quite fit into that world as you go through those programs and you're going to challenge them because what your impact is, is going to be different than the traditional dollars that the, that they usually look at. But I, I really think we need to have a bit of a re-bringing some of those resources into the HASS world so that we can progress social innovations um and I, I i've been wanting for years for this to kind of like emerge in the has field and if it's not emerging here then we've got to go over to that world and bring those resources over mm. my mind's kind of exploding it's time for me to shift so i'm, I'm, I'm learning and listening and i'm really excited because you said something at the beginning about digital innovation and and you're worried that it's kind of a bit scary over here but is, is that one of the ways um, that, that, I mean, anyone could jump in here because that is something that we can start to get resources into the humanities and social sciences around the digital project. Oh, yeah. I think I was just talking about it into methodologically. I'm a little bit scared of automation and AI and all the things <laughs> that we might be doing. Um, but there's no question. I mean, in the social innovation um, wave of social entrepreneurship, there's been some amazing use of um, digital capability. So one of my favourites is a social enterprise in Europe that um, uh, designs prostheses with the people who need them using um, virtual and augmented reality. So they're never actually physically together, but they're fully designed together. And it's like, that's so cool, you know. Um, and if we go back to the research side of things, then yes, I, I do think that there's um, a lot of potential around um, digital and uh, you know, just an example of a project that I'm working on at the moment. Um, I don't know if this is going to come off, and I acknowledge that Kate's a member of the steering group um, and a much um, uh, valued partner in it. But we did an action research project some years ago working with five um, social enterprises to help them, small ones, to see whether they could, we could help them to measure and communicate their social impacts, which is, Sharon said at the beginning, the big, hairy, tricky problem in all of this. Um, and we certainly don't think digital is fully the answer because there's a whole lot of um, resource issues and capacity issues. But one thing we thought was, well, what if we created a platform that's properly curated that allows individual social enterprises to um, document and manage over time material about their organisational features and their social um, impacts? And as the person who does most of the mapping of social enterprise in Australia, my secret um, desire of this was then the back end, if, if 500 organisations use this, at the back end, we've got a darn set. I'm never going to have to survey anyone ever again. Um, so we're now doing a very rapid, because of the nature of the funding, co-design, so light co-design with 65 social enterprises, um, trying to see whether we can do it. And I don't know if it's going to come off, but that's an example where the digital capability is, you know, it's it's developed from a research project that was a more traditional social um, research project, but we've now said we're bringing digital in to see if we can take the impact of this to the next level. Mm. Oh, that's really useful. Thank you. Um, did you want to comment on that before I go and see if anyone else has another question? I'll jump back to the question. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, rather than digital, as, as we were speaking, it, it occurred to me that um, I think social ventures and government are actually natural partners of in terms of taking the knowledge and um, operationalizing it. Um, sort of a, social ventures have a need for it. Government perhaps has the funding for it, but both require to come up with the most triangulation, uh, particularly there. My, my favorite type of uh, research team to work with is actually multidisciplinary, where, where you know, you're not looking down at the past, but across with the business and governance as well. Some amazing stuff that's coming out. I think you're absolutely right. And we, we're hearing, you know, big business and, um, you know, major tech companies say how valuable graduates in the past degrees are. But I still think there's an invisibility to it. And so it worries me as someone who champions our disciplines that it's kind of so assumed, so, so taken for granted that it doesn't rise up and become more visible. 
But if you look at the Academy of Social Sciences um, website materials, there's a lot of really great data out there about just how many social science graduates are employed across private and public sectors in Australia. Uh, you know, just that's just one capture, but there's plenty of data out there. So I think there's, that was a really great discussion. Are there any other questions that anybody would like to ask? Yes, thank you. We've got one over here. Check your microphone, sorry. Yeah, thank you. This is such a fascinating discussion. Um, I'm just picking up on, you know, the um, lived experience that you were mentioning, um, Sharon, um, also the ideas of co-design, um, and actually even this idea of, um, you know, different forms of knowledge across different disciplines, mm -hmm. making space um, to sort of draw on perhaps disciplines and knowledges that we may not traditionally um, look to. But I guess, yeah, Focusing all that around the idea of lived experience, um, for me, that's something that I believe is really important in research and well, everything really. Um, but I'm always kind of left wondering, like, for me, if, if I had the choice, I would think lived experience is always the better option for research projects, but it's not to involve people to co-design with them or ideally the researcher themselves has lived experience. That's not always possible. Um, I'm just curious to hear a bit more reflection about, you know, how people with and without lived experience, like what is what are their respective roles in doing this kind of, of work? I guess for context, my areas of interest lie um, in youth, um, in racism um, and young people from migrant and refugee backgrounds. Mm. Hopefully that's a clear enough question. We were just talking about that over lunch. <laughs> um, and, and I think the discussion was about, you know, like reimbursement as well with regards to lived experience um, is important. I think one of the one of the proudest things I, I with regards to my own PhD and the, and the publication of my thesis, um, because I worked so closely with these 19 community leaders, is that my, 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 my thesis is available in the public libraries. So the citizens can go into the library and grab a copy of the thesis sort of stuff. So they can, they, it belonged to them. And I also argued for keeping all of the data in its raw form at the back of, as well as all in tables so that people could chop it up and use it in other ways different to what how I had used it. So I saw my research as being a community asset for people to be able to use. So I think it goes back to some of what Kate was saying with regards to it is this it is this dating relationship and thinking about what's in it for people that people are investing their time into this research and they're bringing their knowledge in. But I think you know what comes out of it has got to be mutually beneficial um, for both. And, but I think some, some of those sort, sorts of advantages to the community that was left after my PhD is some of the things that I'm most proud of. Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. Um, my brain's going in about five different directions immediately. Um, uh, one is just to share a thing that somebody um, corrected me on the other day that I think I'll adopt, which is um, I always talk about people with lived experience and having their, their, their input, etc. cetera. Um, and I was, uh, it was suggested that I talk about living experience because no one, it's, it's not a point in time kind of thing. So, so I really like that. So I'm going to try and start saying that myself. Um, but thinking about the, the role of, of living experience in uh, in our case, whether it's program design, program feedback at street, um, research uh, that we do, but also in governance, um, in having you know, the, nothing about me without kind of inv involvement in at all of those different levels. And so uh, what we do is we work very hard at street. Uh, we, we have almost daily conversations with the young people that are involved in the program. Uh, we get weekly feedback and they're not afraid to give their feedback um, spontaneously but we also then have kind of structured points at which we, we sort of draw this out they can do it um face to face they can do it anonymously um 
they very much give their report card on the program and we, we, we adapt the program uh, each time with that. And then moving to, to a more structured kind of research with a capital R focus. Um, if we are doing uh, any formal research, say with the university or so on, and where it does involve um, uh, uh, it, drawing on our trainees experience. I'm just thinking of some of the work we've done with you, Joe. There's an enormous amount of time that has to be put in to do that properly and carefully. And so even bringing some of the researchers along on like a mini, not quite a course, but a mini um, induction on how you might work with, with, with our, our very diverse and, and um, uh, complex group of young people. And I'm, I, I don't, I try not to be paternalistic, but I'm reasonably protective around just not letting anyone wander into the room and of asking a million questions or engage in a bunch of things. So I feel like we prepare our young people for the workforce and for other interactions. I need to prepare the workforce and researchers to be able to do that appropriately. Same thing goes for media we do this as well. Um, and then we are 13 years now street um, and just in a position resource wise to start to um, think about a, a formal advisory group of alumni, so of our graduates to be able to have uh, like a stable structure where there's you know four, five, six times a year half a dozen young people paid obviously properly, but it also includes uh, travel and so on. So you need a decent budget to be able to do that. I need a, a staff member who can walk alongside and prepare them for what does that mean to be a part of our governance system and you know, advice into a board level, that kind of thing. And that would then also be an amazing resource for researchers when they want to come and work with us and set up there. So, so I guess my point is incredibly important, important enough to do well. And that, that often means a bit of preparation and resourcing. In the, yeah, so pay what it takes is that it's actually become a popular mantra in philanthropy, but I actually think research needs to be thinking about this as well. Um, and back to the interdisciplinarity thing, I should note that I'm the director of an interdisciplinary research institute. And uh, one of the things that we, um, we're, we're specialists in co-productive research, or at least we say we are, um, we actually have a guideline, uh, which is available to, for colleagues at the University of Melbourne. If you're not from the University of Melbourne and want it, I'm happy to share it, but it's not on the website for, um, you know, reasons of change in um, base rates, et cetera. But we have a guideline for what pay what it takes looks like uh, in research so that we can provide that to colleagues when they're preparing their budgets. Um, I think you've got to ask yourself questions. If, if people with lived living experience, I, I actually call it lived expertise. So there you go, we're all over the place. Um, people with living expertise um, are not involved. I think you've got to really understand why um, and in what context is that appropriate. And there may be some context where it is appropriate. Um, but if people are not willing, you need to stop and ask yourself why, what's wrong with this research design that people are not willing. And that may partly be about who's doing the research. I think we're, you know, the other side of the um, coin uh, in in house, but in universities more broadly, it's thinking about who's conducting the research. So, you know, making sure that our teams are appropriate for the work that we're doing. Um, and the final thing that I would say, which is, I guess, a little bit of a provocation, and it's not in any way um, uh, meant to minimise uh, the importance of involving people with living expertise, with, about which I feel passionately. And it's also important to recognise that good co-productive research is not about recognising the um, expertise of one group over everything else. It's actually about bringing diverse actors together and exposing them to and helping them to co-build um, different sources of evidence. Make, making sense together um, is actually what really effective co-productive um, research looks like, rather than saying, oh, we'll only listen to the truths of this group or that group um, within the research setting. Yeah, well, what a great question. That was really provocative. And, and uh, we were, in fact, talking about that, that question of partnership uh, when we were having our pre panel chat, sort of informal chat, uh, and working together. So I think that's a really nice sort of, sort of kind of bring it back to that. Are there any other questions anybody has? Um, it's obviously stimulating a bit of thinking. One of the things on my mind about this panel was. Um, speaking from you know my position inside the university as an academic um, for the panel really what's the role of research training so um, encouraging students both at undergraduate and postgraduate level and this might be in partnership with social enterprise how do we, how do we involve our students I mean 
you know, right now at my University of Newcastle in New South Wales, there's a push to have compulsory work integrated learning for all students. And I know that other universities are doing this as well. And that's causing our academic staff in the HAS disciplines to feel quite nervous. Will there be placements? Will there be opportunities? Will there be internships? So how can we get involved? Can I quickly, before the people who are in practice say how you might get involved, I think we need, as universities, we need to think about reciprocity. What's the reciprocity here? And that's really important to get clear on um, because I think the history of um, having students involved, and this is not intended as a um, criticism of students, but the history of it is, oh, this is all a bit experimental and can you join us in our experiment? We're talking about small organisations that are very resource strapped dealing with often, um, you know, uh, highly significant social problems and that they're seeking to respond to and working sometimes with people who are vulnerable. So um, getting that reciprocity right is really important. Um, but that said, uh, there is also, there can potentially be great value. And I think it goes a little bit back to something you were saying, Kate, about the relationship building. I think where it doesn't work is where it's a transactional activity and it's one off and then off you go. I think the examples that I've seen where it's been better, and that includes some of my industry-based PhD um, arrangements, has been where I've held a relationship with an organisation for a long period of time over a program of work yeah. and the students under my mentorship, um, you know, and the mentorship of the partner organisation have um, both contributed and developed a great deal in the process, but that's not the end of the story. No. The, the wider research, research relationship is scaffolding that student experience. That's on, yeah, that's right. Oh, I totally agree with you. Yeah, Kate, what would you say? I 100% agree that the, the long-term relationship with you, for example, acts as a bridge of trust um, that then enables us to uh, work faster than we might otherwise um, and to work deeper and with other students that you introduce into it. So there's a, it's like a, a trust bond that comes in there. Um, in terms of how uh, social ventures, social enterprises can create space um, and benefit from, because to be brutally honest, we, we're running a business, we're delivering a really important social outcome, and we want to do that um, in the most informed and evidence-based way. So if we can you know, integrate sort of research is into the mix as well, we will, but it can't come at a cost of, of time. We certainly can't come to cost of money. We, we don't have the money to pay for it. Um, but if I, if I have myself or a staff member onto it and that takes us away from something else. Yes. Um, so it needs to be, I reckon it needs to be overlapped about 80% minimum for what we're doing. And that takes us straight back to not just the relationship, but the co-design um like co-creation of what it is that we're doing together if it, if it doesn't overlap that's okay but uh if we charge ahead and it doesn't overlap then it diverges and that's when it sort of ends mm. in tears and that's happened a few times and, and really the learning for me has been spend the time at the front end getting getting that bit right but the way it looks on the ground can be anything from um kind of student placements, um, specific projects, um, innovation sprints. Um, in our case, it doesn't always have to be. In fact, it's rarely with working with our trainees, with our young people, although that's the area that lots of people are attracted to, to working for. But there's there's so much other stuff in, in a social venture that is worthy of, of scholarly input and research and can benefit from it. So we have, uh, we have kind of almost like relay teams sometimes. In fact, what we've done is we've gotten to the point now where we've been pulled off track too much by, by research organizations saying, we'd love to look at this thing and it's this teeny tiny little thing and it overlaps maybe 5%, not 80%. Um, and, and it's a little bit esoteric for us, but we can see there's something in it. So we say yes. And that was a bad idea. Uh, and we get pulled off sideways. So what we've done now is taken the time to actually get ourselves on the front foot. And I've developed up, it's still in sort of draft form. Uh, I don't have enough digital skill to do it, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. But it's essentially um, a fancy pants database of all of the, we call them mini briefs, all of the things that we would love to have done. And they can be little bite-sized things that you might be able to do maybe even a couple of days worth of work, certainly a week or two, um, up to you know, teams you know, teams worth of a semester type project through to a PhD, through to something that could be part of a um, ARC or CRC combination. And so having put all of that into um, like a database, we can, we can then filter by 
you know, the, the skills required by the topic, um, by the urgency of it for us. It obviously maps up to our strategic plan. We can do our own prioritization. Um, and I think it's going to be a beautiful thing because I mean, someone knocks on the door, we can say, here's, here's the landscape of research that we'd love to do with you. And it, it's a bit like putting your dating profile up at the yeah. front end. And at the university end, um, noting my knowledge of this is old, I do a shout out for UTS's Shopfront program, um, which I think is one of the better models of, you know, doing curated matched dating yes, to yeah. support both student and staff participation with the industry broadly conceived. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Really great. I think um, we're finished with the last word. We'll go to Sharon. Um, uh, with regards to the relationship with universities, we've got a, we, uh, we license our software to universities, our system strange software. And I've got a really great example of the work that's happening over in Western Australia with Cowdon University. Um, they act as a system steward in their community. So they've they've ran a they've ran a a, a lab looking at uh, food security with their community and bringing all of the different food security players, small community organisations, etc., together um, to using using our software uh, to help um, measure and monitor the work that's happening in the community. Um, as they've been doing this work, they have published, I think, five journal articles um, in their public health area. Um, and the combination of collecting the data, working with the community, the five journal articles, they were able to take that to the state government, to the Department of Health. And they've just recently been funded to take this statewide with another six labs across the state. Um, so this whole idea of, of seeing universities as being embedded in communities and how they can be system stewards. Because a lot of the work with like community organisations, et cetera, they'd love to collect the data, especially for problems which are complex problems. We've got a whole lot of players across a, a region working together. Universities are in a really good position to steward that kind of working and to collect that data and to work with those collectives. And I think that being able to collect that data, being able to publish that data, be able to go to government with that data um, and, and in a peer-reviewed form um, enables uh, the government to have trust in what's happening in communities and to have the confidence to be able to scale those kind of... Uh, so I think the university's got an incredible opportunity to take on those more regional projects. Mm. Yeah, well, that's a fabulous place to end. I think, I mean, we could talk for hours, I really think. And what a fabulous panel. Thanks for the great questions. Uh, this has been really, really helpful for me as I think through out loud. It also makes me feel very hopeful rather than concerned about, you know, the challenges that we're all facing in the past or shaped disciplines. I think we should embrace the possibilities here and, and also recognise that we can keep doing the, you know, pure research or based research, blue sky research um, to generate new ideas. So thank you, everybody, for a uh, wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, my